The premise of Van Gogh in Britain is based on the fact that the young Vincent Van Gogh spent nearly three years in England between 1873 and 1876. His love of British culture lost his whole life and contributed to the style and subject matter of his art. He was born in 1853 in the Netherlands and he tried his careers in the art trade as a teacher and then a preacher before becoming an artist at the age of 27 and he died just 10 years later. Hey everybody, this is Robert Dunn from ArtTop10.com and I'm here at this uh, fascinating uh, Van Gogh exhibition today at Tate Britain and I'm very pleased to be mm -hmm. here with mm -hmm. the assistant curator. Yes, I'm Hattie Spires, I'm the assistant curator here as Rob said at Tate Britain and I worked on the Van Gogh in Britain exhibition. So tell me, what's, what's the whole premise of the exhibition? This exhibition takes a really in-depth look at Van Gogh's time spent in Britain where okay. he was absorbing our art and culture as a young yeah. man. He, he just turned 20 when he arrived yeah. here. He yeah. lived in uh, North Brixton in Stockwell. Okay. And he was reading Dickens. As a, he mentions over 100 books by British really? authors that he... That oh, he, man. Um, so he was totally absorbed. Yeah, yeah. And these authors that he was reading. And he, he would... Uh, he's not a regular tourist when he was here. He would, yeah. he would go to parks and uh, yeah. galleries, like the National Gallery, the British Museum, Dulwich Picture Gallery. He'd walk okay. all over oh, London. Did he walk to Dulwich? He walked to Dulles. That's hardcore. He once walked from Ramsgate to Welling Garden City. Really? Yeah, <laughs> he was a big walker. <laughs> uh, and, and he was absolutely fascinated with our, our culture of prints and yeah. uh, magazines. So he was really studying carefully yeah. as when he was working as an art dealer in Covent Garden. Okay. Um, he was just absorbing our culture. And uh, we look at how that affected his work and then how British artists respond to his work in the last in century. Oh, that's really cool. So he wasn't actually an artist when he was here? Was no, he? not for another yeah. seven years. But, seven years, um, man. Yeah, but he would sketch the Thames and things, oh, just so as was, many people were. So he were. was just still drawing? He, he was. He was okay. drawing a little bit. He drew some pictures in Ramsgate where he stayed. Oh, fascinating. Um, so but just was, dabbling as an amateur. Yeah. Yeah. So this was, I think this is something you were saying before, this is why, where he kind of changed and yes. the whole thing. Well, the melancholy right. kicked in. Or? Yeah, well, his first year here um, was one of the happiest of his life. But then yeah. his letters change after that. Yeah. Um, he becomes disillusioned with the art market. Okay, yeah. And well, uh, he begins to become a radical. He starts thinking about teaching and becoming a, a, a preacher. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, his, everything changes. It's and so, fun. yeah. So when you spent the time with the paintings, did, did you get a sense of joy or a sense of melancholy out of them? Did he? Did you? Did, did you? I? Did oh, you? sense of joy. I mean, sense of joy. From where we are in the 21st century, you've yeah. got the story, you have access to the letters. Yeah. It's, it's incredible, but yeah, it is ten, tinged with a sense of uh, melancholy sense as well. Of melancholy. Yeah. And so I think you're saying this is your, your secret favourite. It is it? my secret favourite. <laughs> so um, not why? Why do you like this one so much? Well, one of the things we wanted to do in the exhibition was to challenge some of the myths that were coming out. Okay. Um, and he was often thought of as a really uh, sort of slovenly uh, yeah. dresser, and he always had <laughs> holes in his clothes. And okay. He looked shocking, and actually, yeah. he described himself sometimes as saying that his appearance was shocking. Oh, really? But here he is, all dressed up with his little oh, I tie, see. All looking nice and looking neat, very special. neat. And so, actually, it's not yeah. necessarily the case. He was, yeah, dapper. Oh, and um, nice. some of the lines that we see here yeah. are possibly lines that he saw in some of these engravings uh, okay. that he was interested in. Oh, I see. So, <laughs> so even, even at this painting here, at this point, you think he, oh, was, he was still being influenced by he what was, he'd seen. He was thinking Britain. about he British thinking about art Britain. and artists right yeah. until the end of his life. Oh, that's really cool. Oh, it's very interesting <laughs> to hear, hear much more in-depth from it. It's really good. Thank you very much. Thank you.
time since the last Van Gogh show in London. And uh, the time lapse probably shows us that this is a high time to reevaluate what people actually think of when they think of Van Gogh. Van Gogh painted this view of the St. Paul Hospital Garden after he was confined by illness for several weeks. It's a cracking painting. Pete, what's your view on what's your view on this one? This is a lot better than the earlier paintings. Here, Van Gogh is desperate. A, this is a picture of the uh, institution that he unfortunately had to go into. I think at this point, this is where his painting really hits a high point. He had to finally accept it. He wasn't coherent, he didn't have a message for the world, and um, he was simply allowing the paint to speak. And this is where his tra talent could really shine without all that mental baggage of the results and this this is one of the few paintings that Bangkok painted that assure his legacy. I mean in real life I do like these sunflower things. I mean just been wandering around with a friend of mine who's a bit less into Van Gogh as an artist and um, he's had a few criticisms of of him but I I think these are good. I think they're positive and kind of Full of life, although he was obviously a desperately melancholy, unhappy person at times. But... Oh, it's a fascinating painting here, by Christopher Wood. Thanks to you. Interesting. This kind of largely self-taught, like Van Gogh. Look at that. That's an interesting painting. Look at that beautiful white in the background. A really weird colour to put in the background. That white. It's very, very, very gentle yellow touches to it. It's actually rather neat. Oh, Winifred Nicholson. And Nicholson's first wife. Intriguing painting here. It's actually kind of slightly bizarre and surreal, that one. Apparently, this was also Van Gogh made an impression on her. Fascinating. Looks like they've got weird arms, these flowers. Arms escaping out of the canvas. Extraordinary. And then we have Nicholson, that's right. And Nicholson's dad. Look at that. Actually quite like that, thank you. Strangely enough. <laughs> My name is Nicholson. Very successful life painter. Still life painter. Made at least two sunflower still lifes late in his career. When the sunflowers was on permanent display at the Tate Gallery. Interesting. During the Second World War, many of Van Gogh's artworks were hidden to keep them safe, and his work was rarely seen. But after the war, he was celebrating the exhibition of books and films. The last exhibition was at the Tate in 1947. The war and its aftermath encouraged the idea of Van Gogh as a tragic and alienated artist, whose art expressed the human condition. And of course, some British artists admired his realism and explored the emotional power of his dynamic brushwork and vivid colour. In this room, it's quite interesting actually, this one, you look right beyond Van Gogh. And you know, all the people who were influenced by him, including Bomberg, and of course, these wonderful pictures by um, Francis Bacon over there, which I seem to remember somebody saying they actually all painted in a week when he was desperate trying to get ready for an exhibition. But anyway, let's have a little look at these things.
And that's a weird Van Gogh, isn't it? Yeah. yeah that's his first attempt. Yeah. But I do find it very macabre, this fascination it is macabre. with this avenue of trees. You think the avenue of trees is a. Well, it's kind of. It's a, such a. kind of a heavy weight, heavy handed sort of subject, isn't it? You know, being drawn towards that, it's, it's the most overpowering visual. Image. Yeah, it is. Uh, if his mind was drawn towards things like that, it doesn't bode well <laughs> for his ability to it's, it's, see what was. It's I actually find it quite disturbing. That woman has yeah. no face. Slightly strange, isn't it? Mm. And then, as you say, he was drawn towards it. There's another version of, a, of the same kind of thing over here. Because even more like Monk on the screen, wasn't it? vortex thing, all those yeah. lines converging towards a, well, yeah. a vanishing point, but a, a, sort of a sort of blank ball. It's, it's like looking, looking down a drain. Yeah, it's kind of... It's, uh, it's really not pleasant. This is strange, isn't it? And there's Where is something that? I mean, it's a repetition of these, these trees, which yeah. you can see in all these. Yeah. All these things there, you know, their only function is to form a wall. A well, it's, it's interesting, it's a wall, wall not yeah. a journey through, just a, like yeah. a, a wall. Look, you've even got it here. This is a much more yeah, yeah, yeah. dark one as well. So it's just drawn to these sort of unanswerable, overpowering metaphors. Yeah. I think that speaks to his desire to lecture people. Yeah. Absolute. Really quite boring. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're also, although actually I begin to find them more bizarre, it's I mean, like that person. So it's sort of like a sort of zombie death he person. He doesn't really care about people, does he? Weirdly enough, these ones, no. Know. For all these protestations about how much he cared about the suffering of the working classes, that's where people are in his mind. Just uh, oh, quite frightening. Faceless shadows. It's quite disturbing. Oh look, and this, uh, this must be, who's this painting by down here? This is by... Meindert Hobbema. Do you know who that is? Oh well, yeah, no, that's quite a good contrast to the Van Gogh ones, isn't it? Well, the, the arcade of trees here is an arcade, mm. it's alleviated, it's given the context. Yeah, the road is only part huh? But it's got it's got breathing space around it, yeah, hasn't it? Exactly. You can breathe and whereas Van Gogh's tree arcades are quite and dark. Yeah, they're like more mm. they're more like crushing. There is only there is, is only, only the walls. walls. There's no there's space light. within it. And then what about this? So how do you think um, here we go, this constable fits into the Van Gogh? Does it fit into the Van Gogh? Does constable fit work work? Why do they think he does? Problem, isn't it, with these constables, the ones he's worked on, they're just not as pleasurable as the loose ones, are they? Well, yeah. I mean, the constable obviously suffered because he, he, was, he overfinished his paintings um, to try to, I don't know, I think sometimes these were conceived of as being hanging high up in oh, yeah, holes yeah. in grand houses and all this... Uh, Cottage cheese highlight. <laughs> so you could actually see something when you looked up. Well, I suppose, the yeah, when the flickering candlelight caught the edges of it. Ooh, oh, this cloud's quite good. Best paintings were his sketches, yeah, some right. of the unfinished ones. So the overfinishing thing, um, I don't know, maybe that's what he's got in common with. It's the desire to create something um, sort of heavier than, heavier than reality. Something that will do justice to. So Van Gogh saw this in the South Kensington Museum and remembered it fondly. Ten years after leaving London, he wrote to his brother, I will always keep thinking about some English paintings. Chill October by Millet. Hobham and the National Gallery, a couple of very fine constables referring to the cornfield and Watley Farm. And this is the... And this is the Millet. This is the Millet he was talking about. This is a wonderful painting. It is a wonderful painting. Ah, it's actually really pretty good. Chill October. 
Of course, they're close up, pretty close, close up to these. Because this grass, actually, this grass is quite abstract in close up. It's well, quite he's, loose. He's, I mean, he's chosen and light. He's, he's chosen scale. He's painted big, yeah. which allows him to do this by being fiddly. But what I mm. really like, actually, yeah. is the way that he's used. Um, yeah. Which normally, just down here, normally where you know white doesn't really help. Yeah. Um, it's, and I think this has got a lot to do with the title that Chill you chose October. for it. Yeah. Just this little hint of white here in the foreground. That's that little bit there in that corner is what gives this painting its chill. Oh, it's chill. So you mean? Yeah. That is its little bit of white little where we would be chill. expecting. We'd be expecting this richer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. This is, a, this is a, a glorious, well-accomplished painting by a proper master. Yeah, look, I find it absolutely fascinating that the mid-ground has got, this has got more detail than the foreground. Yeah, he's just, allowed, quite it, intriguing. He's just allowed it to continue there. Yeah. To transition. You up into that the section. And that's where the scale comes in handy. If he was painting at a sort of, you know, size of a fridge door, as it were, yeah. then there wouldn't have been room. Yeah. to make that transition between the scale and that scale. Exactly. It's that awkward bit in the painting, the landscape, the transition between the foreground and the background, yeah. establishing a new crown. That's, there we are, there's a whole painting lesson there, really. Yeah, it's really good, that picture. Because I normally can't bear that kind of detail. Yeah. But in this one, it doesn't bother me. Very good, actually. Bomb buckler.